Good morning and welcome to the Church of the Nativity. It's such a blessing to be here with you. Deacon Jay Clark here with Father Robert Thompson officiating. Uh, hopefully you picked up a bulletin on your way in so you can follow along in our, our service. And for those of you who are at home, if you go to www.nativity4o.org forward slash worship and just click on the online bulletin and you can follow along also with us. So let us take a moment and transition from getting here to being here. seven churches that are in Asia. Grace to you and peace from him who is, who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and frees us from our sins by his blood and made us to be a kingdom. Free serving his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming from the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And on his account, all the tribes of the earth will well. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come. Be Almighty. The Word. Thanks be to God. 
the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. John. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nail in my hand and his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. Please proceed. So we call him Doubting Thomas because he didn't hesitate to express his doubt. And when we struggle with doubt, as we all do, Jesus comes to us and he gives us what we need so that we can believe and so that we can move from the dark place into the light. The other disciples had been certain, as Thomas, that their hopes had come to an end with the death of Jesus. And our scripture reading tells us that. On Easter evening, they locked themselves in a house for the fear of, Jew of the Jews. They had seen Jesus crucified and were afraid that they, as his disciples, might be next. And we might be surprised to see the disciples so fearful. And Peter and another disciple had been seeing the empty tomb, and Mary Magdalene had seen the risen Christ. And Mary told the disciples that Jesus was alive. By this time, on Easter evening, the disciples should have been celebrating in the streets, but were instead locked in a secret room because they were afraid. And we can understand them being afraid after the crucifixion, but it seems surprising that they were still afraid after the resurrection. But then they had only the testimony of two disciples. The tomb was empty in the testimony of one woman that she had seen Christ risen. So what if the tomb were empty? That could mean just about anything. It didn't necessarily mean that Jesus was alive. Now what if a woman said that she had seen Jesus alive? In that time and place, a, a woman's word didn't amount to much. A woman seeing a crime wasn't even allowed to testify as a witness in court. And these men must have been discounted to the testimony, Mary's testimony, that she had seen Jesus alive. Jesus was dead and buried, and they all knew it. But then Jesus came through the locked door, came into their locked room, entered their fear, fearful life, their prison, and said to them, Peace be to you. And the fear drained from their faces to be replaced by disbelief and then joy. Mary was telling the truth after all. It was one thing to hear her tell them that Jesus was alive, but it was another to see him alive in the flesh. But Thomas wasn't with them at this time. 
And at that point, there were only 11 apostles because Judas was dead. And then there were only 10 because Thomas was missing. So the 10 disciples told Thomas, we have seen the Lord. But Thomas said, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. I will not believe. That's why they call him Doubting Thomas. And after all, when a person dies, that's it. I mean, you can be injured and come back. You can get sick and come back. You can even be in a coma and come back. But you don't just die and come back. That just doesn't happen. And if we're honest, we will have to admit here, had we been Thomas in Thomas' shoes that day, we, we would have probably had trouble too. We've all been around doubters at one time or another, haven't we? And these stories are recorded for a reason. They weren't recorded to make Thomas out to be some bad person. They were designed to reflect the human condition and make us reflect on our own doubt. It takes courage to be the lone dissenter, courage to stand up and be counted when there are 10 of them and only one of you. Courage to stick with unpopular doubt in the face of public opinion. And Thomas did that, regardless of the other disciples' opinion. He stuck by his guns. And from this story, we learn that Doubting Thomas became Believing Thomas when Jesus came to visit again. And this time, Jesus was present. Earlier, Thomas had said that he would have to see the wounds in Jesus' hands and side, that he would have to touch the wounds to make sure that they were real. And when Jesus came back for a second visit, he told Thomas, reach here your finger and see my hands. Reach here your hand and put it into my side. Don't be unbelieving, but be believing. In other words, Thomas had specified what he would require to believe. And when Jesus came to the disciples a second time, he offered Thomas exactly what Thomas had required. See my hands. Put your hand in the wound in my side. He gave Thomas exactly what Thomas needed. And Thomas responded, my Lord and my God. In the Gospel of John, nobody says it back. Thomas did more than say, my Lord and my God. The Bible doesn't exactly tell us what happened to Thomas after that day, but we think that he took the Gospel on to India. Now, doubting Thomas became believing Thomas, and belief changed his life forever. The man who had been depressed and unbelieving became a pillar of faith. And that was true for all of the disciples. One glimpse of the risen Lord transformed them all because it proved that they had been right about Jesus in the first place. It proved that there was no difficulty too great for Jesus. It showed them that they had no need to be afraid. And I like the story of the doubting disciples. I like it because, well, I'm a doubter too. And when things are going well, I'm tempted to doubt that I even need Jesus. And then when things are going badly, I'm tempted to believe that Jesus has let me down or maybe abandoned me. I'm always in danger of bouncing between those two poles, either doubting that I need Jesus or believing that he has let me down in some way. But Jesus always tries to help me out of that miserable place. Jesus never stops trying to coach me out of the dark hole and into the light. And when Thomas had trouble believing, Jesus came to him and said, Reach here your finger and see my hands. Reach here your hand and put it into my side. Don't be unbelieving, but be believing. In other words, Jesus came to this man who was having trouble believing and gave him what he needed so that he could believe. And Jesus does that for me too. He comes to me, he gives me what I need so that I can believe. And Jesus helps me pass my unbelief. And sometimes I'm slow to move out of my dark, my dark hole. Sometimes when things are not going my way or going badly, I won't even wonder where God is. Sometimes when I watch the news, especially with the stuff in Ukraine, I wonder why God allows so much evil and hatred in our world. Sometimes when I see the kind of people that get rich, I just wonder, where is the justice? Sometimes I get angry with God and want to stay in my dark. But Jesus never stops trying to guide me into the light. Jesus never fails to give me what I need so that I can believe. 
At that point, it's up to me. It's up to all of you. The ball's in our court. We can doubt or we can believe. Jesus always leaves us that choice. He never forces us. But Jesus always does his part. He always gives us what we need so that we can believe if we will. And some people would say that a preacher should not admit doubt. But I confess my struggles with doubt and my temptations to stay in that dark place because I know that those are all very common experiences for all of you as well. Most of us experience doubt at some point, especially when we're young. When you're young, you have so many unanswered questions. We don't know where our life will take us, if it will amount to anything. We don't know whether our lives will go well or badly, and we're tempted to despair, tempted to doubt, tempted to believe. But I share with you my own struggles because I want you to know that in the end, Jesus has always helped me to believe, has given me what I needed, has helped me out of that dark place, just as Jesus gave Thomas what Thomas needed. So Jesus gives me what I need. And I share this with you because I know that many of you struggle with doubt too. Are also held up and tempted to stay in that dark place and let the world go by. I share my story with you because I want you to know that doubt and darkness need not be the end of your story. Jesus is always there for us. He's always trying to help, always offering us what we need so that we too can believe. And at that point, it's all up to us. We can choose doubt, we can choose darkness, or we can choose to join Jesus in the light. It isn't much fun to sit in the solitude of a dark place. It's far happier to come out into the light of belief. At first, the light can even seem too bright or dazzling. It can hurt our eyes, but once we adjust to the living in the light, we will be able to imagine we won't be able to imagine why we ever stayed in that dark place in the first place. So Jesus told Thomas, because you have seen, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. Blessed. Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. That's us. We've not seen, but we believe. We have not seen Jesus in the flesh. Some people call this Jesus' last beatitude. Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. I've told you about Thomas's doubt and disbelief. I've told you about my struggle with doubt. I've told you that Jesus has always been there for me, has always helped me through my own doubt, has always helped me to believe. Jesus has always given me a choice. He's allowed me the freedom to hide in the darkness if necessary, but has always encouraged me to come into the light and has given me the freedom to doubt, but has given me what I needed so I could believe. So let me close by telling you that in believing, I've been blessed. The life of a believer is ever so much happier than the life of a doubter. And I've been both, so I know. And Jesus said, blessed are those who have not seen and believed. <clears throat> blessed is, is what Thomas was. Blessed is what's true for me. And blessed it will be true for all of you if you believe. Let Jesus bring you out of the darkness of your doubt into the blessed light of belief. Make that choice. And once you once you receive the blessing, you will never want to go back. Amen. Please stand and turn to page three twenty six in the Book of Common Prayer. As we remember our baptism and reaffirm our faith by reading together the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, God the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God.
Turn to page 328 of the Book of Common Prayer. Let us pray for the whole state of Christ Church and the world. Almighty and ever living God, who in thy holy word, holy word has taught us to make prayers and supplications and to give thanks for all men, receive these our prayers which we offer unto thy divine majesty, beseeching thee to, thee to inspire continually universal church with the spirit of truth, unity, and concord, and grant that all those who do confess thy holy name may agree in the truth of thy holy word and live in unity and godly love. Give grace, O Heavenly Father, to all bishops and other ministers, especially Michael, our presiding bishop, Brian, our bishop, Robert, our priest, and Jay, our deacon, that they may both by their life and doctrine set forth thy truth and lively word rightly and duly administered thy holy sacraments. And to all thy people, give thy heavenly grace, and especially to this congregation here present, 